what is a Eurodollar? You're here at Eurodollar University's YouTube channel, and I talk all the time about things like Japanese government bills and Italian 10-year BTPs, interest rate swaps and their spreads, the FX market. What does that have to do with money, or the Eurodollar for that matter? After all, everything we hear in the mainstream is governments are money. Governments have monopoly over money. End of story. No, not even close. The euro dollar is our money. It is our monetary system. And it is nothing like anything you've ever heard of before. What I hope is that by the time you get to the end of this video, you'll appreciate why I use the black hole as both our logo and the analo analogy for the euro dollar system, thanks to David Parkinson's his beautiful illustration, because the euro dollar is hidden from us, largely hidden from us. And most of all, though, like a black hole, it impacts everything around it. So we're left talking about government bills and collateral and FX swaps and things like that because we're trying to interpret what must be going on inside this key crucial monetary system from the way in which it makes everything else around it move. But the, the point here is the crucial, the crucial matter, what is even this euro dollar? It is, as I just said, our money. But where did it come from? What is it supposed to do? All this reserve currency business, how does it get done? That's the more important question. That's what we're going to answer here today. And just so you know, everything we're talking about in this video, that's what we go over at Eurodollar University's memberships. We talk about the history, we talk about the background, we talk about the fundamentals of Eurodollar and ledger money, something we're going to get into here today. That's what Eurodollar University aims to do. Uncover all of this hidden shadow money stuff so that you understand what's happening in our world and why. Because a reserve currency impacts pretty much everything, especially across the long run. So check out our memberships. It's at eurodollar.university. To begin our discussion here, to answer the question, what is a euro dollar? Let's first ask the question, where did it come from? And the answer is no one really knows for sure. There's several origin stories out there. A fellow by the name of Paul Einzig, who was a very well-known economics and financial writer back in the 1950s and 1960s, he wrote in 1965 that he stumbled upon this eurodollar market in London in, 19, in the late 1950s, and the bankers who were operating it told him, "Hey, don't say anything about and don't say, don't tell anybody, don't certainly don't write about it." The first official reference I've seen and I've uncovered to the euro dollar goes back to November 1960 in a magazine put out by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And this is what it said way back in 1960. In this market, generally referred to as the continental or euro dollar market, European and other foreign banks place and accept for varying time periods deposits held at banks in the United States. And that's the, that's the term, for those few who have heard of euro dollars before, that's usually what it refers to, some kind of deposit outside the United States in U.S. dollar denomination. But it is a whole lot more complicated and a whole lot more consequential than just some dollars on deposit with banks outside the U.S. Continuing in 1960. Since many European banks that obtain dollar deposits in this market redeposit these funds with other banks, they act as intermediaries, the overall volume of dollar interbank deposit claims outstanding abroad may well be a multiplier of the amount they cited above, which was about a billion dollars in 1960, which was woefully inadequate. Variations in the volume trading are, however, sizable since the market is highly fluid. So we've got a market where we have these deposits or really claims on U.S. dollars at banks around the, around the rest of the world outside the United States. And then these banks take these dollar deposit claims and relend them to other banks in the market. We're building chains of liabilities in U.S. dollar denominations. We're forming a wholesale interbank network. Back to the FRBNY. Toward the end of 1957 and particularly in the spring of 1958, the new demand met with a rapidly increasing supply as sizable European acquisitions of dollars and easier credit conditions internally brought many European banks into the market in search of attractive outlets for their surplus funds. So late 1950s, it really started to take off. 
One reason why especially European banks were interested in doing this was something called convertibility or restoring convertibility, which we don't need to get into here. But going back one more time to FRBNY in 1960, the emergence at that, at that time of a fully integrated and active foreign exchange market enabled banks to take in deposits denominated in foreign currencies, swap them into dollars, and use the dollars for investment in the continental dollar market. So you can kind of get a sense of what's going on here. We've got banks around the Europe and really the rest of the world, as we'll see, who have excess cash. And they have excess cash, but not necessarily excess liability or excess opportunities. It's not like maybe they have cash that they would like to lend and put to work, but maybe they don't have opportunities in their local jurisdiction. If only they had a way to say, take advantage of someone who really needs excess currency, maybe on the other side of the world, to take, undertake trade, finance, investment, whatever the case may be. And so we have this nascent linking up of monetary excess monetary funds, the ability to take one currency, swap it into another currency, and that currency stands in between all these other currencies and move money around the world in maybe a highly efficient fashion. In fact, that's what the BIS said about the early Eurodollar system when it first finally looked at it in 1964. This comes from its 34th annual report published during that year. Since the mid 50s, and especially since Europe's return to external convertibility at the end of 1958, the foreign currency business of banks in Europe and elsewhere has undergone a very considerable expansion. Such business is not new in and of itself. Of course, we've had foreign markets going back a very long time. But banks have been taking deposits and making loans in currencies other than their local currency and on a much larger scale than before. And in the process, and this is the key part here, there has emerged an efficient interbank market in US dollar and other foreign currency deposits, helping to channel short-term funds internationally from lenders to borrowers. While this massive operations has come to be called the Euro dollar or more broadly, the Euro currency market, other countries, particularly Canada and Japan, play a prominent part in it. You see what's happening. We're developing an entire system to move money all throughout the world to where it needs to go or where the system itself judges that money needs to go. In a globalizing economy as we had in the 1950s entering the 1960s and would continue to have into the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, or at least the early part of the 2000s, there needed to be currency. There needed to be money to finance all of this globalizing economic processes, you know, more trade, more investment. So you have banks stuck in one part of Europe that have excess funds, and you have a company in Japan that can make goods and sell them on the international market, cheaper, per, uh, more productive, more efficient to produce. And there's, before the Euro dollar system, there's really not a good way to connect them. So we have this glow, growing need for globalizing economy, therefore growing need for globalizing money, and an ad hoc or, or evolution of a monetary system in between that allows for the near seamless integration of various banking systems, various currency denominations, all flowing through one single central medium. It's called the US dollar, it's denominated in US dollars, but it's really a Euro dollar network. This is why I talk about all the time how the Euro dollar system resembles more of a telecommunications network than it does what we imagine of a currency. But that's what its goal here is. Now we have banks that are transacting in a common medium, which they can swap in and out of their local currencies or other currencies. You could be a bank in Switzerland. You have Swiss francs, you swap them into dollars. You intermediate through a US dealer in dollars who then swaps into yen so that that company in Japan is able to bring its products to markets that the globalizing economy really wants on the market. It creates an enormous level of efficiency because of how all of this money is suddenly able to move all over the world. Suddenly we have a common medium that's available all over the place. But what is that medium? Because it is not US dollars. 
What we're actually talking about here is instead a ledger money system, a fictive currency or ghost money. We don't have banks who have a big, large vault in which they have these actual deposits, physical deposits of Federal Reserve notes. That's not what we're talking about. When we talk about deposit, the term deposit really means a claim on something. So these banks don't have vaults filled with U.S. dollar bills. They have a claim, a ledger claim on some bank who claims to have U.S. dollars in a vault somewhere. So when we talk about the interbank exchange of deposit liabilities, what we're really talking about is one bank has a claim on U.S. dollars and then relends that claim to another bank who then has that claim. And likely that bank relends that claim someplace else. This network, this integrated network of wholesale money, which is why, as my old co-host Emil Kalinowski called it, it looks more like a fabric, a monetary fabric, because we have all of these claims on U.S. dollars when we don't have any actual U.S. dollars. As Milton Friedman said in 1969, euro dollar deposits are in principle obligations to pay literal dollars, example, currency, all of which consist at present of government issue fiat, that kind of stuff. But in practice, these euro dollar banks and these euro dollar deposits are called on to discharge only an insignificant part of their deposit obligations by paying out currency. Euro dollar banks are called on to discharge a negligible part in this form. Deposit obligations are typically discharged by providing a credit or deposit at another bank, as when you draw a check on your bank, which the recipient then quote unquote deposits in his. For euro dollar banks, the amount of literal cash they hold is negligible. This is not about Federal Reserve notes. It's about these banks creating claims and then transacting those claims all throughout the world. It's not really deposits. We get into more complicated transactions as these euro dollar banks are able, freed from physical cash and physical money, they're able to transact in all different kinds of claims or deposits. This is where derivatives come in like interest rates or not interest rates, but FX swaps. And we already talked about swaps from the very earliest part of the euro dollar system, because that was the key here. If you can be a bank in Switzerland or Sweden or South Africa or anywhere around the world, you can swap your local currency. If you've got excess currency, you put that up as collateral to borrow in U.S. dollars, and then you can lend those U.S. relend those U.S. dollars all throughout the rest of the world. We have banks, we have a system that takes banks from all over the place and can elegantly match those who claim to have cash and those who are approved of by the Eurodollar system as having cash. They can then lend it out to those who actually need it, whether or not they're in the same country, whether or not in the same continent, doesn't matter. We're able to get money and move it around and keep track of everything on a ledger money system all throughout the world. That, my friends, is what a global currency is, global reserve currency is supposed to do. It has nothing to do with pricing oil or commodities in a specific denomination. It has nothing to do with the U.S. government and its mighty military. It has everything to do with two principal concepts. A reserve currency has to be made available in as many places as possible and easily, readily available in as many places as possible. And it has to be made acceptable in those places. So you have the Euro, U.S. dollar denomination from the very earliest days, because these are technically claims on U.S. dollars on deposits somewhere, even though we don't use those deposits, we use the claims we have the U.S. dollar denomination, which already made it acceptable in the Bretton Woods era, but we also have this efficient, wide-scale, global network of banks that are able to transact with one another and move funds, physical or not physical, but fictional funds, all throughout this ledger money system. It satisfies the needs of a reserve currency in a way that we had never, ever seen before. And as a result, the euro dollar actually solved what had been called Triffin's paradox or Triffin's dilemma because Bretton Woods, the gold exchange that came out of the World War II period, Bretton Woods never was designed, was never designed to be able to do this. In fact, as Robert Solomon said 
1984 at Bretton Woods, believe it or not. Robert Sullivan, who was a very, uh, very influential monetary uh, official throughout the U.S. government, uh, Federal Reserve and everything else. In 1984, he said, regarding international liquidity, the Bretton Woods Agreement made no provision for the regular increase in reserves required by a growing world economy. Whether designers of the agreement anticipated that the dollar would play a major role as a source of reserve growth, I do not know, but that is what happened. And it wasn't the U.S. government that created the dollars that became the reserve currency or the source of reserves. Instead, it was this euro dollar system. Because not only does it effectively transmit and circulate money all throughout the global economy, it also creates enough, it creates its own money too. Uh, going to back to Robert Rusa, who was at the same conference as Mr. Solomon 1984, Rusa described the euro dollar system in maybe the best, most succinct terms anywhere that I've seen in doing, you know, 20 some odd years of research into this stuff. What Rusa said in 1984, and Robert Rusa, by the way, he was Under Secretary of Treasury uh, in the Kennedy and Johnson administration. He had been a vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and he looked at this euro dollar system up close. And in 1984, he, he described it this way. This combination of improvisations, this is the government's trying to cope with Bretton Woods, they could not cope with and indeed may have contributed to the enormous expansion in markets for U.S. dollars offshore. And this is the thing, the new networks of interbank relations that made possible the creation of additional supplies of dollars outside the United States and beyond the control of the Federal Reserve. Because the euro dollar came to take over the functions of a global reserve currency. It called itself U.S. dollar, but that was just a technicality, as Milton Friedman pointed out. Instead, this, these new networks of interbank relations had the ability to create the supply of claims on U.S. dollars. At the same time, more importantly, could circulate those claims all throughout the world as needed by the growing globalizing economy. It was absolutely the best design of a global reserve currency system that has been tried to date. And we have to recognize that for a very long period of time, it was, it was absolutely stunning. It created a period of unparalleled global prosperity humankind has never seen before. We have to recognize the positive aspects of that currency arrangement. Even though it used this wholesale, misunderstood, hidden shadow money uh, techniques, not really deposits, not really money, esoteric liabilities, all of that stuff. Even though it used that, it was, it was absolutely... It created this the world, the modern world that we live in. It, it allowed for the human human economy to flourish in a way that we had never seen before. But we also have to recognize the euro dollar's downside. And after 16 years of that downside, we have to also recognize that we're in danger of undoing half a century of so much progress. And the reason is because. It's all hidden from us. So while the euro dollar was doing all of its good, apart from that you know, great inflation stuff in the 70s, while the euro dollar was doing all of its good, nobody cared about looking into the center of the black hole. They just thought, hey, Alan Greenspan's got it covered with his interest rate hikes and whatnot. When in fact, when the euro dollar system was doing all of this stuff, matching, taking money from a bank over here, intermediating through its system and, and coming out with, with credit over there, making sure the global economy had the funds it needed to become a global economy. Nobody cared about this system, which is why there's also a black hole in academic scholarship from around the late 1970s, early 1980s until more recently just today. So the euro dollar system, while it was working, nobody cared. Nobody complained about the US dollar. But since August 9th of 2007, the euro dollar began to break down and it has never come back to where we need it to. It has been too restrictive. We're almost back into a situation like Triffin's paradox. But, and here's the thing here, even though the euro dollar's malfunction has opened the door 
to competing monetary arrangements, cryptocurrencies, other, t other countries setting up their own blocks. The problem is they can't replicate what the euro dollar actually does. Because remember what a reserve currency is. It has to be widely available and widely acceptable. And in those respects, no one has even come close to matching the capabilities of a even malfunctioning euro dollar system. It is still widely available. It is still very widely acceptable, even though it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily create the money and credit that is required to keep the economy growing and flourishing in the way it was before. So it's malfunctioning, but to, to replace the euro dollar means replicating what it had done so very well for a very long time, whether people knew it or not. And that is moving money around all over the place, allowing different parts of the world to intermediate through a common medium. That's what the euro dollar is. And that's why we talk about Japanese government bills and Italian BTPs and FX swaps and interest rate swaps and dealer balance sheet collateral, because those are all things that tell us what's going on inside. They're telling us whether or not money is circulating in the way we want it to, the way we need it to. We're looking at, we're looking at the euro dollar system from the outside. We're looking at how things orbit around the black hole and hopefully making enough of a, a reasonable determination to come up with useful analysis. But the point, the overriding point stands. Why do we care about the euro dollar? Because the euro dollar, whether we can see it or not, whether we appreciate it or not, whether you even acknowledge it or not, that is our money. A huge thank you for everyone joining me today. Those who are curious about how money works, what the euro dollar is, and also an even bigger thank you to euro dollar university members, some of whom you see next to me, without whom none of this would actually be possible. Huge thank you to all of them, and I hope to see you again next time. Take care.